Mario time! So cute! Oh, no. Howdy, it's time we check out Mario. At this point, Mario is pretty much the icon of video games, and he really has an amazing track record of quality titles, stemming from his first debut in Donkey Kong. However, some of Mario's recent adventures have been more of a mixed bag. So today, let's check out the top 5 best and worst modern Mario games. For this list, let's call Mario Sunshine in late 2002 the earliest we can go back to be considered modern. Anyway, on to the countdown. For the fifth worst, Paper Mario Sticker Star. Ugh. I got this game for free with my 3DS, and I still felt ripped off after playing it. As much as I really tried, I got completely stuck in this game. Unable to progress, and having no idea where I was meant to be going. And this was in the first freaking 20 minutes of the game. This was considered a major departure from the critically acclaimed Paper Mario series, because Sticker Star takes this well-respected series and strips it bare of anything engaging, interesting, or meaningful. I hope you like stickers. I mean, you better have a secret sticker kink, because it's the only possible way you'll find endlessly collecting stickers in this game satisfying. The original Paper Mario games were unique, charming RPGs. They had expansive worlds, complex characters, and their own unique, memorable sense of style. But Sticker Star says, screw creativity, and gives us typical traditional Mario worlds that make the game more in line with a platformer than any RPG. On top of that, most of the characters in these worlds are simply generic toads with barely a thing to differentiate them. The characters used to be all types of beings, from Koopas to Goombas to Boos to anything else you can think of. No, no, not you, Boo. Another Boo. Even the gameplay has received a massive downgrade. While the first two Paper Mario games focused on exploration and combat mechanics, Sticker Star decides to focus on tedious, annoying puzzle solving. And not the satisfying kind of puzzles. The kind that make me rage quit the game after an hour of trying to figure that stupid puzzle out. A lot of the puzzle solving relies on new stickers that the game introduces. Mario is able to paste these stickers into the world in order to progress. While puzzle solving itself is a fine thing to have in an RPG, the over-reliance on stickers makes the puzzles feel more convoluted and unclear. The sticker issue also extends to combat where all of Mario's moves have been stripped away, and now all he's got left is a standard attack and run. You want special attacks? Well, screw you! You get more stickers now! This means in order to perform any other attack, you're forced to use a sticker that is consumed immediately once the attack is done. Isn't that what items are meant to do? You want a mana bar for that special attack? Well, nuts to that! That would be easy to learn and useful. Instead, you get one shot and it's gone. But the most frustrating part of all is, you earn absolutely zero experience from battles. So that meek hope of wanting a sense of progress as you grind your way through these enemies? Sorry, bucko, this is Sticker Star. All your fights here will feel hollow when meaningless. This means bosses can't be tough or challenging because we're just hoarding stickers to use up on these stupid things. If you're looking for a good RPG with interesting characters in a unique world, well, keep looking. Paper Mario Sticker Star will offer you nothing of the sort. This game was a tedious, frustrating, shallow-feeling experience for me. And as the first game on my 3DS, this was a tragic first impression for the console. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Man, this is a full-blown love letter to a kart racing series that has been running for nearly 30 years. Mario Kart 8 encompasses so much of what the kart series has built upon over the years. Capturing that careful balance of being competitive while still being forgiving of player mistakes. I think it's that balance that makes this such an approachable, pleasant party game. This time, the roster of characters to choose from is simply massive, with over 40 familiar characters, each with their own personal kart variations. The tracks are well designed too. They're vibrant, they have some good variation, and they have their own memorable set pieces and themes. Unlike some racing games, these levels are easy to differentiate from each other and don't feel too sane. The control and feel is so honed at this point that it's near well perfect racing controls. But it's still approachable, with just about anyone able to jump right in and get a feel for driving in mere seconds. We also get the anti-gravity mechanic introduced, 
And of course, the underwater and hang gliding sections return from Mario Kart 7. And the presentation is just astounding. These characters and locales are given such a lush coat of paint. And I personally think this is among the freshest looking games in the entire Mario series. There may one day be a Mario Kart that surpasses this version, but the care and talent poured into 8 Deluxe simply can't go unmentioned. If you're looking for a thrilling race game to play either alone or with friends, I'd say Mario Kart 8 Deluxe might be worth a try. Yeah. Mario Party Advance Why did this game need to exist? Can Nintendo design and program a full Mario Party game on the Game Boy Advance and make it actually fun? Well, no, apparently not. The game does away with many of the Mario Party series staples like, you know, multiple players on the board, or the objective of obtaining the most stars, or collecting coins. All of those ideas are shoved aside. What's the goal now? Completing menial tasks for other characters. Oh joy! Rather than the game having multiple players or competing to collect the most stars and coins in the game, it's now a game where players travel across the game board alone bring to question why it's called Mario Party. While that's a realistic number of attendants for my parties, I don't know why most people would classify one person a party. So now, we just get a set number of dice, and we can only get more by playing minigames. Unfortunately, even the minigames, the highlight of many Mario Party games, are a major letdown. They're often vague in their objective, they're single player only, and are surprisingly dull. I felt the main saving grace to this game was its witty writing and humour, and it does give it an undeniable charm. It's very well written, and at least that's something to take away from the glum, humdrum gameplay. Yahoo! Gotcha. <laughs> Super Mario 3D World If there is any forgotten Mario game that deserves more attention, I'd say it's Mario 3D World. Despite being a pretty generic title, I'd say it's among the very best games on the Wii U. 3D World is chock-a-block full of creative mechanics and level design. It feels like an evolution of the gameplay of Mario 3D Land, but also original and engaging in its own right. As of this video's release, anyway, this is the first and only 3D platformer in the Mario series to have full 4-player multiplayer. And given it's their first time, it still holds up really well. It lets the game be both a definitive party game and a pleasant solo experience. Yeah! Each of the playable characters have their own attributes as well, which adds a nice layer of depth to the character choice and who you might want to choose to play as. Mario is a usual well-rounded choice, while Luigi's got a springy, slippery feel to him. Peach is a bit slower, but she also floats down a lot slower making her a good choice for beginners to platform. Something nice about 3D World is we get a variety of levels that have a unique feel and setting. Speaking of levels, there are copious amounts of levels in this game. Along with the whole complete main game of 8 worlds, there are an additional 4 unlockable worlds, and some of these levels can really put your platforming skills to the test, without feeling too unfair. Aside from the strong gameplay, the presentation as well is also smooth and pleasing. Unfortunately, 3D World was put on the ill-fated Wii U, so it's not as well known as many other Mario games, but I personally consider it one of the best Mario games to date. Here's hoping a Switch port comes to fruition soon. Super Mario Maker for Nintendo 3DS. Alright, this is an abysmal port. Now, Proper Mario Maker is a game that allows a ton of creativity creating your own Mario levels. So what is so horrible about this 3DS port? Well, let's start with the Maker itself, which is kind of an important detail. I mean, just look at this. The screen crunch when creating levels is a disaster, giving you a cluttered, incredibly limited view. Secondly, the delay when transitioning from course making to playtesting is far longer than it should be, meaning there's lots of tedious wait time as you try to get that level exactly right. But how can Nintendo assure your creativity and incentive is completely stifled? By making you unable to share levels online, and only through 3DS's Street Pass feature. That means if you want to obtain any levels created by other people, you have to encounter them in real life while you both have your 3DS on you. How asinine is that? Especially when the 3DS is more than capable of connecting online. I guess Shigeru is just being obnoxious with this port. You can still play some levels online, but there are only select curated ones that Nintendo has picked out. Woohoo! These Nintendo levels feel underwhelming and don't provide any semblance of challenge at all. To make things even worse, the graphics are lackluster and performance is choppy and slow. 
I understand that the 3DS is nowhere near as powerful as the Wii U, but this new style just looks so muddy to me. It doesn't even compare to the new Super Mario Bros. 2 which came out in the same system. And finally, slowdown and lag is a major issue when lots of things are on screen, which is completely baffling considering it's a 2D game. 3DS Mario Maker works hard to make itself feel as redundant and dated as possible. And it's more redundant than ever now that we have a portable Mario Maker in the form of Mario Maker 2 on the Switch. So I'd say just stick with that. It's way better. Yahoo! Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door This is among the first games I think of as some of the best Mario storytelling we've ever gotten. The Thousand Year Door is one of the standout titles in the GameCube, and for good reason. Despite Mario generally not being a series focused on story, it's among some of the best RPGs on the console. Mario gets a ton of unique and interesting characters along his journey, ranging from the cautious Koops to the surprisingly deep and melancholy Bobbery. Probably my favourite of Mario's companions is Goombella, the second year archaeology student from the University of Goom. Even Yoshi's back, freshly hashed from his egg and with a new spunky nature. The battle game plays that old turn-based RPG style, and we use star points to level up Mario and his friends. Plus, well, it's all very self-aware as every battle set on a stage, with a friendly crowd constantly cheering you on. This, and a nice boppy but not too overwhelming soundtrack, all help colour Mario's various battles. Originally introduced in Mario RPG, I've always really enjoyed the timing-based attacks Mario and the crew will do for each fight. It helps avoid the fights feeling monotonous, and it adds that interactive element. And like any good Paper Mario game, we'll get a ton of colourful locations on our way to find the crystal stars and open the Thousand Year Door. From the Schwamp Fortress, to the Bogly Woods, to the floating town of Glitzville, or the Creep be steeple. Even after 15 years, Thousand Year Door remains among some of the most colourful, story-filled, unique, old-style RPGs I've ever played. Mario Party 10 Personally, I felt some of the Mario games got weaker around their 8th installment on the Wii console, though I felt Super Mario Party on the Switch was a big improvement. You see, I felt this decline started to happen when the series shifted developers from Hudson, the developers of Bomberman and Bonk, to now being handled by ND Cube. They're known for such stellar titles as Wii Party and Animal Crossing Amiibo Festival, arguably among the worst in the Animal Crossing series. What could possibly go wrong? So we suddenly went from an ever-evolving series that kept varying colourful board themes and branching pathways, to now being extremely linear, bare bones and downright bland. And the words bland and Mario Party really have gone together too often in this list. Mario Party 10 represents the all-time low for the series. As though the developers weren't even listening, it still retains basically all of the issues from Mario Party 9 and Island Tour as well as adding two mediocre and unbalanced modes respectively. The normal Mario Party mode is basically identical gameplay to Mario Party 9, featuring extremely linear boards, with each player being in a car so all of them move at the same time. As a result, the fate of each individual player is completely out of their control. Issues even extend to the minigames. Not only are minigames more infrequent, with every player moving simultaneously, but there's now even less incentive to perform well in the minigames. This is since penalty or reward to how you do doesn't even affect your progress in the game. Probably the biggest novelty is Bowser mode, which is like regular party mode, except with a fifth player that plays as Bowser. The fifth player chases down the other four and tries to eliminate them in Bowser minigames. The minigames of this one are quite fun, though they're incredibly unbalanced in Bowser's favour, so you may have less fun if you're not Bowser. Plus there's only 10 of them for a full game, so they can get pretty repetitive. I like the concept of the Bowser mode, but it does feel pretty poorly executed here. Lastly, there's an amiibo game mode that takes a sizeable chunk of the menu. It's basically a watered down version of party mode with the most linear board possible, as well as each player needing to tap the amiibo on the gamepad to do anything at all making this game mostly just a tedious bore. It was clearly just a barefaced attempt to push the new amiibo that had been released at the time, and integrate it in the laziest way possible. Mario Party 10 represents everything wrong with the modern Mario Party games, and it served as a much needed wake up call for ND Cube, because as I mentioned, Super Mario Party for the Switch was a tremendous improvement over their first three games. Yahoo! Yahoo! 
Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2. Talk about lightning striking twice. Mario Galaxy is a jaw-dropping ensemble in all aspects, and it's regarded by many as one of the best video games ever created. And on this, even I can agree, because I 100%ed both of these games back a decade ago, including with Luigi. Graphics on the Wii simply don't get much better than this. From start to finish, this vivid, vibrant galaxy world is beautiful. From the stars, to planets, to so many different worlds. This game is a pleasure to watch alone because of its graphics. The soundtrack is also amazing. Having a mix of both fun tracks composed with synthetic instruments, and fully orchestrated tracks that fit the game's interstellar scope perfectly. And the gameplay isn't far behind the presentation either. It's perfectly balanced, approachable, challenging, but rarely unfair feeling 3D platform. Our goal being to collect the power stars. Mario's new spin attack is also a welcome addition to his moveset. And waggling the Wii remote to do it does feel intuitive. And it quickly became reflexive when I was correcting jumps. It functions as both an effective attack against enemies and serves as a freaking savior on many platforming puzzles. It's a pleasure just exploring these varying galaxies, just witnessing their different themes and creative level design. There's also a somewhat detailed and interesting backstory to the franchise newcomer, Princess Rosalina, the mother of all Loomis. You know, those chibi star things. And honestly, Rosalina became one of my favorite minor characters, and I really like when she shows up in other games. I included both Galaxy 1 and 2 on this entry, as they are mostly the same game at their core. Though the first one does try to focus on its presentation and theming, while the second one focuses on level design and mechanics. Plus, 2 has Yoshi, in case... You know, you wanted to ride Yoshi in the horrifying vacuum of space. I played the bejeebus out of both these games when they came out, and there's been no 3D platforming experience to me, quite like Mario Galaxy 1 and 2. And before we get to the number ones, let's go through some quick honorable mentions. Super Mario Maker. Apparently, the dream for many Mario fans has been the ability to create their own Mario levels. And as of 2015, Nintendo's let us do just that with Mario Maker. The concept here is simple, but it works incredibly smoothly and well, especially on the Wii U with its touchscreen. Creating levels feels effortless and comes very naturally, with the game having loads of features to make it easy to create levels. The game isn't only creating and playing your own levels though, as you can play any of the thousands of levels created by other players online. It lets us experience firsthand the boundless creativity from Mario fans that grew up with these games. You can even try your hand at the 100 Mario Challenge, which pits you against a huge gauntlet of tough levels, with you having a total of 100 lives across all the levels. The series has done so well that there's now even a Mario Maker 2, which has a surprisingly unique story, where Peach's castle is now destroyed and Mario has to rebuild it. And all the levels show off the massive creative potential that can be unleashed by creators. Overall, I'm very glad to see this series taking off, as it means people are using their spare time to get even more creative than before. Mario Kart Double Dash Double Dash has managed to stand the test of time, and it's still one of those Mario Kart games that many like to revisit. And that's mainly thanks to its gimmick of the player controlling two characters on one cart. This may sound like a novelty, but it adds a lot to the gameplay to give the game's driving a unique feel. Not only are carts now heavier as a result, but each character can hold one item each, with a player being able to seamlessly switch between characters at will. While Double Dash does stay true to the Mario Kart formula, I can't deny it, its unique mechanics make it a game well worth revisiting. Mario Party 6. This is actually regarded by some as the best Mario Party game in the series, and it does indeed stand out among the rest for its unique day and night cycle. The time of the day can change on the boards, leading to changes in gameplay. Plus, both the boards and the minigames felt especially unique and fun here, with some really memorable areas and some great additions to the minigame library. This is a downright solid Mario Party title, scoring an 8 out of 10 on almost every mechanic Mario Party does. It's a good time with friends or alone, and that's what Mario Party's all about. Anyway, on to the number ones. Mario Tennis Ultra Smash because when you think Mario, you obviously think tennis. Who wouldn't? When I think about the Mario franchise, I typically think of a long list of solid quality titles with a ton of affection and care put into every aspect of the game. Gameplay, presentation, Nintendo plans these games carefully. 
Unfortunately, no series is perfect. And Mario Tennis Ultra Smash is that big zit on your college friend's cheek the night of their date. The gameplay at its core is just a generic tennis game with Mario characters, with added gimmicks to try and give some semblance of originality and vary gameplay. But that effort is truly futile. This gimmick comes in the form of the Mega Mushroom power-up and the titular Ultra Smash. The Ultra Smash is a simple, boring spike shot that players can initiate on occasion, while the Mega Mushroom is a highly unbalanced power-up that gives the receiver an unfair advantage. The player grows to a gargantuan size and hits super hard, to the point where it can just feel unfair. And just for chuckles, I guess, the other player will quickly receive a mushroom afterwards, resulting in both players being even, negating the whole freaking purpose of the power-up item. We couldn't have just filled up a meter or something? The cherry on top of this is the same jarring cutscene of the character growing over and over each time the mushroom is obtained. This shifts the camera away, halts the progress of the game, and gets annoying quickly. In addition to the core gameplay being uninteresting, the game modes are even more lacking. With there only being the standard mode, with Mega Mushrooms and Spiking Shots. A mode with only Spiking Shots, a pure tennis mode, and an amiibo training mode that is nowhere near as in-depth as the one in Smash Brothers. With a lack of interesting gameplay and a severe lack of content, there seems to be little reason this game was made other than to make money during the holiday season. There were much better Mario Tennis games made before and since this game, so there's absolutely no reason to take a look at this half-hearted attempt at a Mario game. But if you like tennis, and I mean really like it, to the point you keep a racket under your pillow, well, even then I'd just say play Mario Tennis Aces instead. Gotcha. <laughs> Super Mario Odyssey. Odyssey is simply oozing charm and care in every facet of its world that has been handcrafted by the developers. Odyssey takes the 3D open world gameplay from 64 and Sunshine and refines it even further to near perfection. Mario controls beautifully in a 3D space, and with his added partner Cappy, he has even more abilities that feel natural to pull off. So what's the story? Are we collecting stars? Ah, that was so 20 years ago. Now we're collecting moons. And this time, Bowser's serious. He and Peach are finally gonna tie the knot, but Mario's just the wedding crasher to ruin his plans. Mario's new possession ability adds a ton of new ways to collect the MacGuffins. Just about any creature you find, you can take control of and play exactly as they look. There's a beautifully open, free world feel to this game. The game's non-linear, open design also allows players to pick whatever moons they want to collect, more for progression's sake rather than being railroaded and collecting moons in any sort of order. Each of the worlds in Odyssey are incredibly well designed, with a ton of character and life breathed into each one of them. Each location manages to feel huge with a lot to see, while also feeling compact enough to not feel too big to be barren. And the level design lends well to Mario's awesome new abilities. The amount of things to do in Odyssey feels endless, with there being a whopping 999 power moons to collect, along with a ton of outfits to unlock as well. The bosses are also lots of fun to fight. Each one is dripping personality, and with more of that creative innovation like we saw in Galaxy. And the final boss is the perfect climactic ending to this masterpiece. And man is this presentation good. As of producing this video, this is the best looking Mario game so far, with a spine tingling, energized theme song, and some of the best Mario background music I've heard so far. Odyssey manages to give us the best of both worlds, an in-depth gameplay experience, yet also a fast-paced cinematic experience, somehow combining the core gamers and the casual gamers' primary interests. Mario Odyssey is that nostalgic Mario experience from the distant past, right now. I can easily call this the number one best modern Mario game. At this point, Mario is arguably the longest running video game series of all time. Since he first popped onto the NES so many years ago, Mario may have grown older, but dang if he hasn't done so with grace. Adapting with the times, sharpening his platforming, and continually attempting to give gamers simply a mirthful, joyful experience. I struggle to think of another series that comes close to matching Mario's seniority and legacy. And it was a pleasure to get the chance to talk about them with you. And if you have your own favorite or least favorite modern Mario games yourself, 
feel free to post them in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.